Okay, everybody, we'll um, get things rolling. How come my... Is my thing on? I thought it was green when it's on. Oh, okay. It's on. It's taken me five years to figure that out. <laughs> okay, we'll uh, open the Finance Committee meeting for the 23rd of May 2019. First uh, off, we have apologies. Um, Martin Gallagher for absence, uh, um, Andrew King for lateness, and hands are going up around the place. I may have to leave early depending how long the meeting runs, so cool. I'll, I need to be away at quarter to two. Yes, and <coughs> Bella, I think, and Dave has advised me he will be leaving early. No, I think <laughs> Set a target, have you? <laughs> Okay, I'll move the apology. Uh, sorry, is there any other apologies? No. I move the apologies. Uh, Bunting, Mallet, those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. Uh, confirmation of the agenda. I will move. Can I have a seconder for that? Um, Mallet, Casson, those in favour, those against, carried. Thank you. Unanimously. Uh, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? No declaration of interest, thank you. Uh, public forum, we have Roger. Come on up. You know how it works, Roger. You've got five minutes, inclusive of um, questions. If, uh, if, if, so if you don't mind, leave a little bit of time at the end for, the, for questions, if that's possible. Yeah, all right, okay. thanks. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, Gary, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm talking about the Wheelers collections of renewal of contract with the Wheelers for the library, uh, Heaven Public Libraries. It's going to be. Uh... Oh. oh, thanks for that, uh, Dave. Uh, yes, um, about Wheelers uh, renewing a contract for a two-year period, and uh, I, uh, the charges. Um, the collection contract would uh, the charge would the charge the cost of the contract would uh, be renewed would feed through feed through to the library services. So we've got um, for the in demand books we've got five dollars to take a book out for one week, and although that's quite seems quite reasonable, there's often there's not a sufficient window of opportunity for borrowers to read the book in one week. Um, it would be far, far preferable to give them an indefinite period of time to borrow the book and read it. Um, if they could get a... Uh... <clears throat> yes, yes. Also, there's, it's, I understand that the the original contract was set up in 2016, and since that time, the main public library in the CBD was closed for a. Was all the uh, services were transferred to another building, and that caused quite a lot of disruption to the um, main services. So there hasn't been sufficient time to assess whether the contract has been success, a success or not. And I think I just think that some caution should be. Um, applied as to whether we, we have quite enough information based on the, um, um, the public library only reopening, the main public library just here in Garden Place, just opening just early this year. Um, oh, we have a question. Oh, Ryan. Thanks, <coughs> Sorry. Are there any? Ryan. Just, you mentioned having a book out for an indefined period of time. Isn't that a bit stink if someone's waiting on a book and someone's got it for three or four months? Well, at the university library, they had a system where people could, if they, if they wanted that book out, they could let the library know, and the library would send a recall notice to the borrower to send the li library book back. It's just that when, when you take a book out, you, you don't know what's coming up during the week, and just everybody, every borrower, something, something might suddenly come up and they don't get a chance to, chance to get past page two, past page one, and it's just been $5. And that puts people, that's, 
it's putting people off from, from borrowing the book in the first place because they know that they won't get value for money. Otherwise, it might be, and that might be the case as, as a case with me sometimes. And preference to actually, this, this applies only to new books that have just come out. And preference to borrowing a book for five dollars for one week, when you're not sure whether you're going to get a chance to read it during that week, it's preferable to spend forty-five dollars at Whitcalls to actually purchase the book, and you have a you have a lifetime to read the book. Because often I find in my own situation, I'll it'll take me um, it could. It can take me a while to get around to reading the book. Um, and it's, it's, these books that have been in the library on demand are actually quite difficult books to read. You, you can't just read a book in one week. You need, you know, you, I read the books several times. The first of all, I read each part through and then I read the whole book through once again to make sure I understand it. For example, if you think of the book it was on $5 charge, it was a Hillary Clinton's book. Yes, that's right. Or what happened? Yes, uh, following the uh, disastrous election result for her and, and the um, presidential elections in America. So thanks. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Roger. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. Okay, next item is item five, page six, the confirmation of the minutes of the 9th of April 2019 meeting. Uh, are there any questions or changes? Sorry? Ready. Okay, and I'll second it. Uh, are there any questions or concerns? All right, those in favour, those against, carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next item is item six, um, <clears throat> page 17, H3 report, third quarter. Sean. Um, good morning, Mr Chair, everyone. Um, just if I may, I have a couple of things I'd like to speak to uh, on this report. And if um, you wouldn't mind if I refer you first up to um, page, so your page 26, which has a, of the report, which has a table for the um, Claudelands uh, financial summary for the uh, three quarter period through to the end of March. Um, when you get to that, if you look at the uh, table itself and if you go to the variance column, unfortunately we have an error that I need to alert you to. At the very bottom of that column, it has a figure of 416 in red and in brackets, um, suggesting a operating deficit against budget. But in actual fact, it should be black and it should be unbracketed, so that's actually an operating surplus against budget. So that's just a, an error that's occurred there. Um, the other two items that I would want to speak to as well is are on page, we'll begin on page 18. Uh, we were originally going to have Andy Bolton who uh, manages our um, venue operations or one of the venue operations sorry, manager. Sean, are you talking to the page with the photo on it? Page 18 did you say? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, page 34, your page 34. Oh, so there was sorry. Lots of yeah, that. sorry, I looked at the page <laughs> for the report itself. 34, yeah. Apologies, yeah. Uh, and, it's set, and I'm referring first up to section 6.2 on that page. Two. Thirty-five. Oh, I've got 34 here. So, so look, 6.2. 6 yes, sorry about that. Um, okay. All right, 6.2 of the report. Um, so look, as I was saying, Andy Bolton, who is one of our operations managers uh, for H3, was going to come to the meeting today to talk to you about the uh, recycling and sustainability projects that we have embarked on at the venues um, with an aim to improve our performance in terms of um, uh, handling waste uh, and also in terms of um, upping the ante on uh, sort of environmental sustainability in terms of the impact that our stadiums have. Unfortunately, Andy's unable to join us today uh, as he's away on um, medical leave. Um, I won't go into any detail, and Andy will come to the next uh, meeting at the fourth quarter report that we present and talk to you in more detail. Um, but I, I can assure you the, the work is underway. Um, we've actually begun to uh, have new uh, rubbish bins installed throughout uh, Claudelands, uh, and we have found a workable but slightly expensive solution for sorting rubbish 
out on uh, special tables out the back of the, the venue. And we're working very closely, obviously, with uh, Montana Catering uh, on that work. So just to, to give you assurances that it is happening and we're, we're full track ahead. On the, on the issue of overall sustainability, um, when our venues have been built, we actually had been fortunate enough that there were a certain amount of um, consider considerations taken into design in terms of the treatment of water, um, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, all the three waters, I suppose, you could almost say. Um, but we are embarking on trying to work out what else we can do. Uh, I would signal to you that we have looked at a few different sustainability uh, programs that are available out there. And we have, um, while we're working on it, uh, I want to be up front and, and say to you that some of it we haven't found that useful um, because it's very much a, um, quite often it's a, it's a pay the fee and here's, here's the kit and you know self-regulate and mark yourself sort of thing. We need more help than that. So it is taking us a little bit longer uh, than we had hoped in terms of working out what program that we will um, subscribe to and be a part of. The second part that I wanted to refer to, uh, which is actually um, bullet points or the section 6.3, which is immediately underneath the section that I just talked about, recycling and sustainability, is to do with uh, security at venues. Um, as you're well aware, the impact of the events uh, <coughs> some um, couple of months ago in Christchurch put all of New Zealand on a different stage of state of alert and a different state of awareness in terms of security issues. At H3, we've always had, uh, we've always been having discussions that we have had slight concerns over how we manage security in general at our venues. Um, and the impact of the event at, um, in Christchurch has really heightened our awareness and as a result of um, changed attitudes and a few changed uh, requirements of police who we work with closely, for example, on event day controls, um, there are quite a few changes coming up. We're working with a broader council on a, a wider project that Dave Bryant's area is covering off in terms of um, security provision. Um, but I would stress it won't just be for event day activity, it will be for day-to-day -day security. So if you think about it, um, some of our venues are very easy access and very open to people to, to go in and out of, and we need to be tighter on that control. We also have instances on our days where we're packing in or packing out for a major event, where on, at the extreme end we can, we can have up to 100 subcontractors or people coming and going on a single day. Um, that we don't have proper security control or security clearance for. Um, so that'll be an extra issue for us. And obviously then there's event day controls. We're actually very comfortable with what we do, but the standards or the bar is being raised much higher than what we have had um, previously. And you will slowly notice that with events, um, uh, some that have already happened where there'll be increased security, there'll be increased uh, wanding, There'll be a lot more rigour in terms of what you can take into a venue or the amount of things you can take into a venue. Um, and then the fourth item that we are focusing on is advancing our response preparation in the case of a security breach or an action. We're very much geared up very well for fire, crowd control, um, some sort of a, a, a physical incidents, but nothing along the lines of what Christchurch has occurred. So we are adding on to that. I'm telling you about that now because we are working quite closely with police. We're working closely with other venues on a national basis, uh, as well as the work that council is, is doing uh, for itself. But I do want to assure you that we're taking it pretty seriously, but we are going to do our best to keep it um, a little bit invisible at the same time, so it's, it's, there's no real big dramatic change where we can. But there's no doubt that there will be some changes. And as we develop our plans, <coughs> and I suspect for the time that we look at our next annual plan, not for the 1920 year, but the one beyond, we may well be coming to you with some proposals for additional things that we might have to incorporate into our venues. Um, you know, such as uh, crash barrier controls and, and so forth. So all I'm doing is giving you the signal that we're working on it, we're taking it very seriously, uh, and there will be more to come. So with that, uh, Mr Chair, I'm happy to hand over. Thanks, Sean. Uh, I've got a list of people who want to speak. Paula. Thank you. Just um, no surprises here. Just um, touching um, base with you, Sean, around the movement as far as conferences go. Um, you didn't have one in Q3, but quarter three, third quarter by the look of it, because it said zero attendees. So the 4% is 
revenue, how does that is that just carry on from a, the previous quarter, or um, does no, that mean you didn't have any conferences over that? No, not not at all. Um, basically, this you're referring to graph 3.2, which is yep. on my page 28. Um, yep. It actually, I should have raised that with you. It actually shows a really absurd skew that quarter three has for us with the types of events that we have as a percentage of our total activity. So quarter three, basically January through March, has abnormally high sporting events uh, and exhibition events. So we still have had plenty of conferences. It is a quieter time for conferences. Um, so don't think we haven't been having conferences at all, but the proportion of our activity is very heavily skewed to sports. And, and obviously the sevens is the main skew on that one that, that drives the, the income, the revenue figures up and the attendance figures for a quarterly thing. So in hindsight, I need to work on this chart to make that a bit more clearer so you get a bit of a better picture rather than it just being quarter three. Yeah, yeah, that, that would be useful because I thought, well, you've got 4% revenue but you've got nobody attending a conference Yeah, well, by the look of the, the chart. Little, yeah. um, and just in respect to that, uh, are we still in the, I suppose nothing's really changed in your ability to harness more or to grab more conferences into Hamilton, is it? Um, What's happened? Are we looking good for the rest of the year? Yeah, no, no, very good. In fact, I mean, this month has been particularly, the month of May, we've been um, particularly busy, and our forward book on conferencing is really, really strong. Uh, what is interesting, just in the last um, two weeks, we've had a massive surge of uh, quotation requests for next calendar year for 2020. So we're, we're in a really big rush period for next year conferencing activity. So we're, we're pretty comfortable with um, where we're tracking for conferencing um, uh, going forward at this, at this particular point in time. So it's, it's looking pretty good. Okay. All right, thank you. Oh, no, one other thing, sorry, and then recycling. Um, so we are measuring the, from what you said, I think you said, we are measuring the tons of recyclable material but that's all um, mixed waste at the moment. Yeah, where we have separation, we, we're measuring the separation. Where we don't, it's, we just have a landfill figure. But uh, what we're trying to do is um, get more recyclable product out of what tr traditionally would go to landfill. It's as simple as that. But part of the challenge as well with that is where does the recyclable product actually go so that it's yeah. sent in the right direction. And that's, and that's still quite a bit of work to do on that. Yeah, I might say something about that later. But, mm. but um, in respect to the easy wins, um, the making it really obvious where your very, your plastic lids go, your glass, because people buy bottles mm. of yeah. beer and then put it into the plastic cup. Uh, it should be relatively easy to capture the glass, but it's still getting mixed up with other waste. Yeah, we generally don't um, hand out glass. So if someone is buying something we decant into a plastic mug, um, so, so the glass is very easy for us to cover off through our, our food and beverage outlet or services. Um, it's the um, having a bin that says plastic waste here yeah. and people putting plastic waste in it is the challenge. And yeah. so uh, that's a challenge that all venues and different, all locations, not just in our zone, so um, I, have. I have been to a number of events where um, being given a glass bottle and um, at the till and then I have to decant it. Yeah, and, correct. And then um, it's not terribly easy. I see people just chucking, or yeah. leaving the bottles lying around, but chucking the bottles any which way. The new bins have only just have only just gone in, but we right. st we will still, even with the new bins, we will still have a problem. Uh, and uh, we're talking to some of the venues or some event organisers in Auckland, for example, they actually employ staff to stand at the bins to direct people to put stuff in the right place. And even with staff there, they are still challenged at times by people taking notice. It's 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 um, it's not something I'm trying to hide behind, but it is just the reality of, of the challenge. So even if we have a bin that has for plastics only or for glass or cardboard or whatever, we still have to sort that bin physically out the back of the venue at the end of an event. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ryan. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just. Sean, FPOS, where's that situation sitting? Uh, we're st FPOS at the Stadia. Um, we're still in discussion um, with our hospitality provider on that. Um, they remain um, uncertain as to um, uh, the costs involved of having FPOS, not just the commission, but additional equipment and so forth. They remain nervous about the impact on 
uh, service time and delivery. Uh, we are fighting, well, I shouldn't say use the word fighting, we are pushing back on that very, very hard, and they have agreed to um, do some observations this winter for rugby at a number of the um, other venues around the country to just get um, feedback. But to be blunt, we just have to convince them that it's the way to go. And they're yet to be 100% convinced, but they are much closer than they have been. Um, Chair, I'm just, I'm just forwarding um, something to Amy that I'd, I'd like to um, move the motion, but just add a note to support you in that, Sean, that um, I've, I've sent it to you that elected members can see it soon, but essentially that uh, staff explore the possibilities around that, the options, just so that A, it uh, strengthens whatever they're doing, and um, B... Ryan, can, can you just be really clear what you mean by F-POST? At the moment, it's cash only at most of those things, isn't yeah, it? Is that what you're saying? So credit cards and F-POST? Yeah. yeah, it's like a Coliseum where we've got this beautiful building, but we've got to pay with coins and rubble. So um, <laughs> I've, I've sent forward an amendment. That'll come up soon. So I'll go on to my next question. Anyway, if that's right, then you'll see, you'll get the... Um, gold coins. Um, I've got to read my annotations on our new thing. I've put a sticky note here. My sticky note won't open. All right, I'll go to I my other question. I don't have that problem with this agenda. <laughs> um, on page 20, page 23, Sean, um, <coughs> well done on all your figures. It's, it's absolutely fantastic in terms of you've exceeded budget, etc. I just wonder, will next year's budget still be uh, sort of conservative or will you forecast these additional revenues as, as business as usual now? Do they get locked in or do you? Um, well, with the annual plan um, uh, that's just been reviewed, we actually did revise our revenue upwards in the revisions uh, that have been put through. So we have made an adjustment based on our forecast activity, which included um, you know, a, re, a revisit of our forward bookings as at the date of the review of the annual plan numbers. So, so yes, they have changed a little bit. Um, I'd just be, um, I'd, I'd just caution you that we do not, uh, we have a policy of not budgeting in the possibility of a really big thing if we don't know we have that big thing uh, happening. So if we know we have an All Blacks test, for example, or if we know we have a, a Disney on ice, uh, coming at budget time, we budgeted it, we put it in our budgets, but if we don't know that it's happening and we're still still working on it, we won't include those big ticket items that provide a big hit. Yep, fair enough. Um, page 32, I note in the graph with CapEx actuals and the forecasters that sudden merge at the end where our, our um, was it actuals? The actuals are jumping up. Is that the set in towers? That uh, yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark. <coughs> uh, two questions. One, I just want to reinforce Ryan's questioning about the FPOS. Do you think that um, perhaps they could just go to everywhere else in the world and note that everyone else is using FPOS except for them? Would that be enough to convince them? or mm. Perhaps a bit facetious. Okay. Thank you um, for the are question. We, are, we, are we pushing hard enough? Because I, uh, I, I yeah, look, we are pushing, like brother, we are think, pushing yeah. hard enough. Um, I don't want to push so hard that they say, well, if you want it badly enough, you pay the cost. So, so I'm still, we're still putting the onus on our hospitality provider to pay the costs involved in using EPOS. So, 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 so I'm, I, I don't want, it, it, I mean, I'm getting into a commercial conversation here, but I don't want to put ourselves in a position um, where, where we have it put on us. Oh, well, if you want it so much, you pay for it. Clear, so just so I'm clear, avoiding that clearly conversation. Sure the contract is, is silent on this matter, is it? Correct. Otherwise, you would just go to the contract. Okay. Mm. So again, so, sorry, didn't understand your question. So the, sometimes the contract would specify that you have to allow, well, probably not use, a detail that you, yeah. but, but so if the contract allowed us to do what you're saying, yeah. it would just be an easy one. Just you, you've got in, to follow yeah. the contract, but clearly mm. it's not, uh, it's, it's the, the contract yeah. doesn't say anything about it, so that's why it is a matter of a negotiation rather than a matter, yeah. you know, look what you've signed up to on the contract. So how long until we renegotiate that part of the contract, Sean? Oh, that's uh, several years away. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> I will have one more prod at this, but um, in your experience, like the average punter is paying $3 every time they take cash out. Is that how much it would cost them to put their possibilities <coughs> in? Uh, I, look, I, I couldn't answer that question. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Um, the, there was some talk earlier on about a conference, um, a conference bookings 
and under threat because of a lack of accommodation. Is that still the issue? Uh, very much so. Yeah. Um, we we continue to have a uh, a number of um, conference opportunities come our way that um, fall over because accommodation is not available. Yeah. Um, simply because there's just no bookings, uh, no rooms available. They're pre-booked for for whatever reason. So yes, it is still actually our biggest, um, biggest single problem. challenge. Yeah. I really, really back our venues. I know yeah. we have great conferencing venues, and our, I know that our reputation in, the, in that market is extremely strong right yeah. now, but uh, the hotels remain our biggest challenge, or lack of hotels. Okay. Um, yep, that'll be, I'm fine, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jeff. Thank you, Gary. Um, Sean, thank you for this. There's a lot of really good... Uh, positive stuff in here. I've got two questions about security, um, 6.3.4 and 6.3.5. You mentioned in here that um, once this full plan on security has been done, we're likely to see more costs, both capital and operating, coming back to us, um, which I presume are unbudgeted at this stage? Yes, or? they are. So an example, and I'll just give you an example of a capital cost is the need for additional crash bollards, for example, at our various entranceways. Um, the need for additional um, automated security gates, cardiac systems. I mean, we're still going around with keys. Um, and uh, systems, you know, no different to what we already have at, at council, like the cardiacs for this building. But it's just a matter of extending that. So that's an idea, an example of some of what we have. In terms of... Um, uh, other operating costs, some of that will be costs that we would have to bear in terms of additional security for day-to-day -day, um, coverage of our venues, but uh, where it's additional costs related to an event day um, uh, or even special packing circumstances, we would ordinarily pass those on to the client. How, so how significant are these costs going to be? Uh, I, look, I really don't know. I'm hoping they will be... Um, relatively insignificant, but I am obviously trying to condition you to um, think about the fact that this conversation is, is coming. And okay. it's not just for our venues, by the way. It's um, I think David's area um, is looking at, at that elsewhere. So you mentioned, I think, that there's a bit of a national move towards this. How much discretion is there at a local level to say, nah, that's a bit over the top, maybe let's, let's be a bit more pragmatic here? I mean... Is that going to, I guess I'm looking for assurance that that kind of thinking is going to go into it and we're not going to go yeah. over the top. No, well, we have a fair amount of discretion in terms of what we um, choose to deploy uh, and do. And so, for example, day-to-day um, -day security levels and this, the level of whatever level we want to set, that is that is a discretionary point, and we, we, we weigh that up against what the perception, our perception of the risk is. Um, when it gets to event day, however, we are driven by... Um, the requirements or standards of our clients, um, and we're also driven by advice from um, other agencies such as police, for example, who, who give us a lot of advice. If you think about some of the events we have, we have a certain security standards that we maintain for a Chiefs you know, Super Rugby game, for example. You get an All Blacks game in, or you get the Lions coming to town, it's a whole new world. Um, so just it's different layers according to the nature of the event, and the minimum requirements of the um, organiser of that event. Um, just Councillor Jeff, I think there's indeed the following Christchurch, I just still think the police are settling down to where the level Correct. of um, yep. risk assessment is going to be. And I think a lot of this stuff is going to be Correct. done in conjunction with where that lands. And I think you're right, there's got to be a certain degree of base level of what's common sense. Mm. Um, but I think that needs to be assessed once everything settles down and we get back to what is the new normal yep. and until that point yep. in time. And what, we'll, what we will do is part of this, but yep. for all aspects of councillors, we will bring the police in <coughs> for a briefing with the councillors in terms of what they believe the expectations are in these areas that we can better understand what our responsibilities are versus them. And also, it's a level of service debate. If it's not regulated to a certain degree, mm. it's up to you as elected members to set that level of service based on your understanding of what the risks are. And you will get that opportunity as well. Okay. Thank you, it's, Richard. It's, it's, and if I could just add to that, if I may, um, uh, just to remind you, we are working with other stadia and, and other venues collaboratively, and there's a special working party form so that we can actually try and all agree um, as close to a national standard um, as we can in, in a sensible national standard. Cause okay, thank you. But one very last one on that. There's, can I just again seek assurance on 
um, I guess, customer experience because there can be a fine line between um, security and intimidation sometimes. Yep. And I guess I'm just, I'm just seeking some assurance that in terms of, say, security guard behaviour, we're not going to see overzealous behaviour. This doesn't extend to roughing up streakers or something. Um, you know, behind the behind the stadium afterwards or something. Uh, I'm being I'm being silly there, but but I but actually, um, whenever whenever you see a streaker come on, the crowd the crowd go crazy, and and I, I think the side the, the the sight sometimes of security guards appearing to be overzealous doesn't do us any good. No, you're exactly right, and that is a conversation we are continually having, having with our um, supplier, our security suppliers, Red Badge, for example, and, the, um, and, and they do take great care not to seem to be overbearing or whatever. And if you think about the Sevens and our success of the Sevens tournament here, we've achieved exactly that compared to the approach taken in Wellington, to be blunt. Okay, so um, we are, we are absolutely. well aware of this yeah. and, and we do... Okay. Absolutely, but once again, I, I would say there are certain standards of, for certain events, and there are actually rules that rugby has um, that aren't our rules relating to streakers yeah, know, um, yeah. uh, to do with them on the field. So, um, uh, no, you, you make a good point, but if we have an adjustment that we require to have um, X-ray machines, for example, or um, more thorough bag searches... Yeah. Um, so it will be an adjustment period for people to get used to the increased rigour and so they will feel a little bit okay. taken aback. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Siggy. Chair, and thank you so much, Sean, for your report. Uh, just going back to... Um you actually talked about it that you, you, you're in co conversation with other conference centres around the country and um, in, in, in the safety arena, but um, are you also... Um, how would you feel that if all the, or mm, how can I put that? How would you feel if all the, the conference centres had the same level of, or the same rubbish bins, so it makes it even and standardised? Would that be of help? Like uh, if if that was uh, uh, from the government, really, you know? Uh, look, yeah, no, you raise a very good point, and and that uh, would would help a lot. Um, uh, if we had a standardised approach. Unfortunately, everyone's a little bit different. Um, so we have been putting quite a bit of time to understand what everyone else is doing yeah. uh, on that front. Um, I, have an, I have a personal view that the bins should all look exactly the same yeah. and have the same descriptors yeah. and everything else, but it, that's a part of our evolution that we have to work through. Yeah, because uh, people are going in, into different centres. They go to Wellington, they go to Auckland, they, and if everything is yeah. different. So, yeah, totally get that. Um, just another, a couple of more questions. Any chance for the cricket union to pay something towards the light towers? Uh, no. Checking. <coughs> no. Not after last night's announcement. <laughs> okay, uh, I didn't think so, but I, I have to push that one, that issue. Um, the other one you said on um, on the, on the first page at the executive summary. Um, H3 increasingly operates as a single business with its, it, as a single business. Is Sigi, that a good just, thing? Sigi, or can you just give us a page oh, number? Page um, 16. Is that, a, is that a good thing or you're feeling too much um, on your own or um, you feel you've got enough support from the rest of the council? Oh, absolutely. Um, look, I, I think that I'm, I'm not quite sure where that comment is, but basically we, we do um, do very different types of business day to day, very different types of transactions very different types of customer relationships um, because of the nature of our business compared to what would be the norm for council. Right. So with that in mind, we are sort of slightly standalone. We have our own operating system, for example, mm -hmm. be purely because of the transactional requirements and the inventory management and control that we're required to have. So um, no, that's absolutely a normal um, th state of affairs and I'm very comfortable with the way it is and it's, it's certainly been a part of the, the brief I've had since, uh, since I joined. Just one more question to, to what um, Councillor um, Hamilton put up there. Um, with, with the operator not, not uh, having FPOS machines, isn't that, I mean, the, the statistics really say that the, the, the more you have a card, the more people spend. If they have to have, carry cash, they actually spend less. Wouldn't that be of advantage to them to, to have that? Look, I think there's a lot of arguments, you know, <laughs> 
for and against on, on everything on this whole issue. So we are working through that, but please, please um, uh, be assured that we are working with them on that. Cool, thank you so much. Rob, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks, Sean, for your detailed report. Uh, first question is on the FPOS. Am I correct in saying that FPOS is available at the stadium? There is a an operate, private operator who provides cash yeah. when you go in. Uh, yeah, there, it's a it's a private um, machine uh, that you you go to and you can get cash out. Um, but it's another queue. There's a fee. Yeah. Um, it's not when you're actually picking up your pot of chips and your hot dog. Um, yeah, okay. Like a lot of people are used to. But the to. queue will just really yeah. transfer over yeah. to the to Correct. the queue that you're waiting yeah. for the I mean, with I mean, your cold, with your chips going cold. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. part of the yeah. challenge is. We have these venues that really only have massive numbers of people for a pretty limited number of single days in the year. Yeah. And so gearing up, gearing down, yep. it's, yeah. Okay, question on security. Um, I noticed in the, um, in the annual plan discussion that we had on Tuesday that we've provisionally allocated uh, 250,000 in the annual plan as a fixed term resource for risk security. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the Lagoima thing is also um, added as part of that 250. So I'm unsure how much of it is Lagoima and how much of it is risk security. But do you think, um, and we guess, we're both guessing here, but do you think that there's sufficient uh, in the budget to cover what you think? I mean, you, you, you're on that risk yeah, area so, perhaps more so than yeah. other parts of the organisation. Yeah. Do you think we've got enough provided for in the annual plan to do a proper risk assessment that will give us a confidence that what we're doing or what we plan to do going forward is going to be effective given the times that we're operating in? Yeah, look, I think it's ideal um, for what we need, having talked through with Andre, our risk manager, who's, who's leading that project, and uh, we need the help, we need the expertise, so we're very... Um, comfortable with that and I like the fact that he says we're sort of number one on the list as well so okay um, it's good for us so you'll share in some of that some of that uh, funding D do you know David how much of it is allocated to Lagoima and how much of it is uh, for that risk security uh, what do you call it resources for risk security well, it, at this point in time our recruitment is underway so it, um, that 250 is a provision in terms of and so we're just working through that. For the, the two for people who will do that? Yeah, or, or that's the, right. Okay. And, and for obvious reasons, it wouldn't be appropriate to disclose the salary. Yeah, no, that's, no, that's fine. So, so Sean's uh, H3 will benefit from that spend. They won't first have to go the and rank. do their first own spend the separately. So just to be clear, the whole purpose of getting this staff member in for 12 months is to, um, is to provide a, a, a risk framework and a gap analysis across all of council activities um, and an under understanding of um, um, what would be appropriate actions to take Councillor Ryan's um, concerns. Um, a, full, a full briefing would be coming back to elected members so that you would see exactly what the outcome of this assessment is mm -hmm. and you'd be fully informed throughout the whole process in terms of decisions you wanted to make. But when we were in the um, strategic risk, audit and risk workshop the other day, we talked about a soft approach to security, so not... Yeah. Not barbed wire fences, but just yep. appropriate security. Yep. Yep. Okay, and last question, Sean. On page uh, 21 and page 5 of your report, um, you've got the year-to-date um, operating um, results for H3, and I see we're about one and a half million dollars. Uh, the deficit is about at 10 million, is about one and a half million less in budget, and 16 million is the expected loss for the for the whole year. How do you think the year's going to land, given that you know we're almost through two of the last three months of the last quarter? How do you think, uh, you know, are we going to come in under budget, under, under the 16 million budget, and do you think it's going to be consistent given the events that you know that have happened since March and will yeah. happen before the end of June? I think it'll be consistent with the variance that you currently see now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for the extra question. I forgot to ask about the corporate boxes. Sean, I understand they're, they're on their way and on a boat from China. Is that right? Or? Uh, correct. Um, ready to be installed soon, hopefully. Okay, so we've got the. Are they before or after the test? Will they be in, do you know? Or? Uh, before the test. 
Okay, so um, installation time, actually, it's, it's not much to put them in and everything else is ready to go, is that right? Yeah, there, there's actually been preparatory work done on the ground already in terms of ground bolts for moorings and things like that that has been done there. And you'll, if you go down there, you'll see there are some security gates around those areas. So I'm not sure of exactly the timing, but there has been a, had been a delay with the chiefs getting the, the boxes out of China. But my understanding yeah. is they're just about here, if, if not almost. So it's, it'll be happening soon, very and soon. Um, you, without revealing anything commercially sensitive, are they, they're all pretty much sold, aren't they? And they're, they're, very, uh, they're very happy. Yes, they are. Yeah, pretty much sold as far as I'm, I, I haven't had a latest yeah. update, but no, okay. they've um, sold very well. It's been unfortunate for the chiefs that they've had the, they've had the delays that they've suffered. Um, yes. While you're asking a question on that, um, if you look out the back of Claudelands underneath the willow trees, you'll also see the um, actual towers for the new lights for Seddon Park. They've also arrived, so Ooh, kind of there's quite a bit going on. You'll love it. Yeah, excellent. Okay, no, that's cool. And because uh, la at last report, the Chiefs were a little bit grumbly with the way the the, the box situation was, but they're they're happy now. Oh, look, they're, uh, yeah, they're yep, yeah, they're moving ahead. They're fine. Okay, okay. thanks, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, uh, I just got a few. Um, on paragraph one point seven, Sean talks about the farmers' markets. Do they pay a fee? Uh, yes, they do. Okay, thank you. Um, on paragraph 1.12, uh, could you just um, remind me how the sevens, sorry, how the sevens work? What what years we have it and when we, because we're sharing with Fiji, aren't we? Uh, that's correct. So they, so New Zealand Rugby have re-signed a contract for with International Rugby to host sevens for a further four years. We have been notified as the um, host city. Of, um, of record for the four seri for the full four year series, and we will have the first of those four series and um, uh, taking place in January next year. Um, and then the idea is, that is we'll then go to Fiji, come back to Hamilton, then to Fiji. So alternate okay, dates. So Having said that, if Fiji uh, proves to be challenged in terms of being ready in time for 2021, for example, we uh, have undertaken to pick it up. Okay. So it would come back here. Um, and um, our head of our turf services at H3, um, KJ, he's actually off to Fiji next year at, um, oh, sorry, next week at um, NZ Rugby, oh, sorry, International Rugby's cost to go and consult with um, uh, the Fijians about the work they're doing to get their, themselves up and running. Thank you. In terms of the turf. Okay, uh, paragraph 1.14, um, just the wording is a little strange to me. Um, in addition, we were able to maintain a margin despite additional costs of delivering the event. This is the sevens. My understanding is that, that <clears throat> the sevens was quote unquote supposed to not cost anything to the rate payer. Correct. Um, yep. yep. So we actually make. So we are actually making a little bit of money on it. Is that what that means? And we did last year as well. Oh, okay. It's it's really on the auxiliary services and things that we provide where they need our help, and we're in a position to charge them for it. Them being um, uh, NZ Rugby and 37 South. Okay, thank you. Um, on okay, this is, so on. Sorry, I have to use the uh, paragraph names because my agendas are slightly different than yours. Uh, so 2.1 is the financial um, table, financial summary, mm. and this is more a question to David or Richard uh, regarding the finance costs. And uh, the honesty, quote unquote, of the <laughs> David's ears prick up, of the figures, um, the finance cost um, line in there <clears throat> shows last year the finance costs were 2.2 million. This year they're currently year to date 1.4 million. Um, everyone knows that the um, H3 um, doesn't run at a cash surplus, so it never generates any money to pay down debt. So how how can it be? It's just interest costs. Don't yeah, it? yeah, and, and interest costs is, tag, uh, is on your um, your debt level. That's right. But we also and the and the interest cost interest rates have gone down a bit, but nowhere near as uh, yeah, enough to, right. to, to do that. That's right. We also have interest. Um, um, we have money invested, and so we have more interest yep. um, income this year than we had in the prior year, and so that's a share of that, which okay. is driving that. So it's interest costs. It's a net of interest costs and interest savings. Okay, so even though H3 delivers cash losses, which increases our debt, 
correct? Yep. Um, interest finance costs charged to H3 have dropped significantly. And that's because this year we have a significant amount of interest income coming through. So that, that finance cost is a net number between interest costs and interest yeah. income. Okay, so my concern is that we are um, inaccurately allocating our interest costs. No, we allocate it across all activities of council the same way. Okay. Okay, oh, we'll have a talk offline on that. Yeah, we'll okay. catch up on that. Okay. Um, on paragraph 2.4, uh, Sean, you say ad additional costs relate to ongoing uplift in revenue. You mean an ongoing uplift in activity? Uh, well, both. Uh, I mean, ba basically, uh, because we are doing a lot more um, activity and, and generating more revenue than budgeted, we, there are costs of sales that go with that. So that's really where that's um, part of the um, adjustment on the expenditure side. So. OK, thank you. Uh, 2.5 just below that, and I think Rob has already asked this question, but you, you say um, at, at the moment uh, we're below budget by, sorry, where actual is 10 million loss, um, budget uh, year-to-date loss was 12 million, so we're about uh, 1.3 million better off than we were expecting to be. You're suggesting we'll come, so in the next quarter, you're, you think we will change that such that we're only under budget by 500,000. That's quite, that's $800,000. Um, improvement in the next quarter. Now, I know we've got some big events coming up, and which you've just sort of talked about, but that's a big move. Uh, uh, Chair, can I come back to you on that? I actually, um, I think you raised an interesting point that I need to clarify myself in terms of that statement. Okay. Thank you. Um. Oh, okay, and this is, uh, and Sean, We've had these debates hundreds and hundreds of times, and it's not you didn't make the decision to do these things. You're trying to run these things as well as you can. But I just highlight that on uh, what's a paragraph is it? So it would be 2.8.2 um, that at the moment we budgeted to spend a dollar eighty to earn a dollar. We're actually doing better than that. We're spending a dollar fifty to earn a dollar. Am I reading that right? Yeah, I mean, basically, okay. we're we're talking about our, our performance against our budget. Yeah. Okay. And I picked I had picked up your adding mistake there. Okay, that's me done. Um, are there any further questions? Okay. There is a. This is actually the motion because the other thing hadn't. So this is not an amendment, is it? Okay. So there's a motion on the thing. Okay. Moved by Brian and Mark. Is there any debate? Uh, Ryan. Uh, yeah, thanks. Just to reiterate, I just, I just don't buy it that we can't get the uh, 21st century functional with FPOS anymore. We've got people selling car park, sorry, coffee in the backs of car parks off a, off a cell phone. You can click a card. We've got Apple Pay. You can pay off your phones. Um, we need to get... Um, people don't need to line up to get cash to then go line up and get hot chips. It's it's a clunky, antiquated, and it's not best in business. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna hang on to this one, Sean. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Mark. I'm just in support of uh, of Ryan's comments there, and um, I appreciate the the position you find yourself in, Sean, with this this contract. Uh, perhaps it's something no one's got a crystal ball. Um, but uh, from what I can understand, they are pretty similar operators to the ones who operate in Claudelands, and they seem to be doing okay. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be keeping my uh, my pressure on that one too. Um, I also want to um, compliment you and your staff um, for what you've done. I'm still getting um, really positive reviews from organisers of events who deal with uh, the Claudelin staff, and so I'd be grateful if you could pass on my thanks anyway from around this table um, that uh, that they are. Like you say, best in business. They're really living up to those community outcomes that we, we adhere to, uh, and I'm very, very proud of them. Um, I echo your comments about the lack of accommodation, and no one can suddenly build a hotel because we suddenly want one. It's going to be commercially viable, but uh, it's getting closer, I hope. And um, But also, regards to the security uh, concerns of, uh, of security guards roughing up people, I, I, 
I think we've probably got the friendliest security staff in Red Badge that I've seen, um, to the point of, are you, do, you, do, you, do you want to search me? <laughs> Almost encouraging to them. Um, so, You're yeah, sick, mate. Eh? Hey? No, no, it's not like sick. that. It's not like that. <laughs> um, so, again, please please pass on um, my gratitude to them because I think they, they're doing a great job. So, considering what you've got to work with, I think you, you, you and your staff have done a fantastic job. So, apart from the EFOS, everything's great. Uh, Paula. Thank you. Support the comments that have gone before, particularly the best practice around payment. Um, you, can, you can barely, you can walk past something and pay for something nowadays, just about. Um, so, um, but in the waste one is the one I'm going to keep my <laughs> eye on the ball about because there again, there is a body of best practice and the only way forward is to uh, avoid mixed waste and the only way forward is to um, put the best systems in place to achieve that and we should be showing leadership and it's no, dis it's no disrespect because I absolutely understand the barriers that you're talking of, Sean but we must be leaders in this space. It's one of the, and Ziggy may talk to this, I'm not sure, but it's one of the issues that's been robustly debated in the Waste Task Force Group, that this is a um, area which we can get big wins across public behavior and public attitude to recycling, and that we have such fantastic um, event venues, we want them to be the very best at waste management as, as they are the best at event management. Um, so that's where we're heading, and I know that um, Councillor Henry, I don't like to speak for you, but I know that and I share your frustrations when we've been at some event events together and seen people co-mingling waste that so easily could be separated. Um, we're looking for the low-hanging fruit in the beginning, but we're also looking to push to be leaders in this space, in my view. James. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Sean, and all your um, event staff at H3. Uh, I'll um, mirror what... Um, Councillor Bunting said, do a fantastic job and um, get some really good events to our city. <clears throat> in regards to the security situation, you know, this is something that's going to impact our finances in the future. And um, it's extremely unfortunate the uh, Christchurch events uh, will forever change the way we will now police and supply security at our event venues or other large public gatherings. Um, I too, like uh, Councillor Jeff, am concerned in regards to the to the real possible rise of uh, costs involved. Uh, we don't know where that's going to go. And, you know, um, when you um, supply extra security at events, you do sometimes get uh, the possibility of excessive restrictions and overzealous treatment of streakers, to be uh, like that. You know, how you grab them, where you grab them. Um, but we will be uh, damned if we do and damned if we don't uh, play our part in uh, offering a certain level of security to try and minimise harm, because you can never prevent harm, you can only minimise, um, not only to our Hamilton residents and other domestic and international visitors, but also to our very good friends in Tamahiri. I prepped you for that one, didn't I, James? <laughs> uh, Siggy. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sean. Look, I, I think you're doing a great job, and I won't repeat that. But and we have got this, these amazing venues, and um, and I'm just going back to the um, to the. Uh, um, recycling to the rubbish to the waste minimization. I know you, you're trying hard, and, and it's not just you that I'm frustrated with. I'm frustrated all all around the city with with the events that, that are happening around the city, and um, and I just think sometimes, yeah, it is it is not easy. And if there's no uniform um, waste minimization around the country and, and no uniform bins or anything, it is just so hard to do that. And and we've got one of the best venues here. I mean, we hear it all the time. Claudelands is amazing. So we really, really should be the leaders there in, in showing the other venues what we can do. So um, let's keep working together on that <laughs> and, and just finding a, a really, really good solution that can, can be adopted nationwide. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I'll just uh, chip in. Um, just councillors, I think we need to be aware that the, the FPOS discussion, which we've asked Sean to um, uh, partake in, is go will have to be a commercial negotiation. There'll be two parties, and in this situation, uh, both parties do not have equally aligned views. Um, there will be a commercial aspect of this, so we need to be wary of that. So, um, you know, it's not going to be a slam dunk, and there's another another guy in the, in the debate who... Um, has to be has to 
agree to the whole thing anyway. And just with regarding this, the um, security thing, um, I was lucky enough to be at Rugby Park in 1981 when the game of rugby was called off. Um, and there, uh, yeah, the, the, the security thing is an extraordinarily difficult, diff, you know, to, to determine what level of um, security you can have. You know, things like streakers and that, when you compare that with what happened in 81, are completely and utterly frivolous. But, um, you know, you've got to take cognizance over what the, the public want, what the, and sometimes the public want the streakers. <laughs> they may bring people to the venues. Uh, but anyway, so um, that, yeah, the security thing is a very, very difficult uh, one to, how long is a piece of string type situation. Okay, um, the motion has been moved. We will vote. Oh, we, we've had debate, haven't we? Yeah, we just don't need to go to the things. All right. Uh, we'll just do it. Okay, all right. You can almost hear the wheels grinding, can't you? Trying to... The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we're now on item seven. Capital Portfolio Monitoring Report, page 37. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Morena. Um, so, look, uh, Talking to the capital report, which is page 36 of 143 on diligent. I think it's, um, sorry, okay, yep, we've got the wrong page, correct, <laughs> 35. Um, so I want to, just Did one correction one? first, um, councillors. So um, paragraph 2B, um, so we don't have the financial strategy report to this meeting. So I apologise for that. Our standard suite of reports was the three, but this meeting we don't have the financial strategy report. So if we could just delete 2B. Um, so just to be clear, that was because that was considered at Tuesday's council meeting. Yep. Correct, yeah. I think the next one is coming up, David, the next strategy report. Uh, the next financial strategy report will be the 1st of August Finance Committee meeting, and um, I'm going to balance the purpose of the annual plan was obviously to look forward the impact of the decisions on the next 10 years and given that you went at the council meeting it was no point duplicating. We also made, also made decisions on the day that changed that anyway. Uh, so councillors, if it's okay through you Mr Chair, I'd like to take the report as uh, read with the exception of uh, just having a discussion on some of the risks around the uh, programme portfolio. So page uh, 41, uh, paragraph 57. Um, so key risks on page 57. So I just wanted to step through some of the key risks. Um, um, so 57, 58, 59, 60 talk about the key risks of our transport uh, projects and uh, basically uh, attracting subsidy. To attract subsidy we have to do a business case to get um, the subsidy. So there is an emerging um, uh, issue coming with subsidy uh, nationally in terms that the National Land Transport Plan uh, is oversubscribed in all the categories. So that would translate... I'm on uh, page 41 of 145. Maybe give us the paragraph numbers. Yeah, in paragraph these, 57. Yeah, okay, I'll, sort of, um, yeah. all over okay. the Paragraph 57, 58, 59 and 60. I'm page, the page number. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I've got a... My agenda, I mean, this is a written unit. It's different. So on diligent, it should be... Um, diligent, right? It's one page out from the... Uh, page 43. The page... Page 40, yeah. Key risk? Mm. C57 is on page 43. <laughs> page 43 on one dry, 41 in the agenda, and 40 on diligent. <laughs> I think it's the same version, but it's dropping the agenda on diligent is reformatting. Uh, <coughs> Apologies, elected members. We did um, have to make some changes to the agenda 
as are updated, some of the page numbers, they might be one or two pages out. So they'll be in the, the general vicinity. Okay, so paragraph 57, 58, 59 and 60. Um, so there is an emerging uh, national um, situation in terms of um, NZTA funding from the National Land Transport Plan. Um, we, th there is a, um, a, a workshop or a briefing being held at the Ferry Bank on the 4th of June, uh, where the Chief Executive is doing a bit of a roadshow around the, co the country to um, indicate the extent of uh, that funding situation. So we don't have all of the information um, at this moment and how it would affect our um, programs, um, but we are certainly getting a view that it will affect some of our, our, our projects. So just to be clear, we do have a number of uh, large projects which are funded and not at risk. So they include the Waiuri uh, Drive Cobham inter uh, intersection, um, it includes our whole Peacocks program and our move into um, the Peacocks Southern Growth Cell. Uh, Thomas Gordonton Road has already been funded, approved and built. Uh, the Rota Cowrie Public Transport Facility um, seems to be secure, although there's still one more step to go. They've approved that at enhanced FAR for all the pre-implementation work and with a high expectation that that will flow through to implementation. Um, all of our low-cost, uh, low-risk programs and our operations and maintenance and renewal programs are all funded and not at risk. Um, so at risk are uh, some of the other um, projects in our transport improvement program. So we would expect to have more detail on that in the coming days, and we have scheduled to take a report to Growth and Infrastructure Committee uh, we also have Ross the Anson, the Regional Partnership Manager at the next Growth and Infrastructure Meeting as well. So, um, so we've been uh, flagging that emerging risk just for a little while. Um, it, it, it was sort of, we'll have some more clarity soon. If I go over the page to um, paragraph 61, 62 and 63, so it's just an ongoing um, noting of the risk about the resource available to deliver our program. Um, it's a risk that sits in the background for us, but at this point in time, we are still enjoying good competition and all the tenders we're getting out, and it's not manifesting itself in any delays there, but it's something we've really got an eye on. Um, so then lastly, just some uh, um, actual risks emerging, um, paragraph 64 to, through to 67. Um, so we have uh, just found some uh, asbestos which was um, uh, a, a surprise to us on the Ring Road project, so we're just working through that, so asbestos is really difficult to deal with, um, so there may be some implications of that, we're just working through that and we'll report that through once we've understood that. Um, and the Tiawa Cycleway, um, we've made good progress on our section but it is co-dependent on the sections to the um, south through the Waipa and Waikato district councils and there may be some that one, and I'm unsure how that would be affected by funding at the moment. So councillors, I'm happy, uh, we're happy to take any questions on the full report. David. Uh, yes, thanks. Chris. You said the 4th of June workshop, you initially described it, then you said briefing. In actual fact, it's it's not really anything like that because it's not going to be interactive, is it? It's where N NZTA is going to tell us and we're going to sit there and soak it up or suck um, it up. Mo uh, yeah, that's that's correct. It's, it's probably more of a road show where the chief executive or the acting chief executive is coming around to uh, explain the funding situation. By then, I think we will have clarity and detail and what uh, that means. So we should be able to brief you prior to... Uh, um, that so road it's, show. it's a PR exercise because we'll, we'll not because the, the reason I'm asking is not just to have a go at NZTA though they should be having someone should have a go at them because of the way they've handled this should be gotten at but uh, I'm Martin this is a question here do we not need to know like now yeah. so that we can adjust our uh, annual plan uh, and our, even our LTP going forward, isn't it? I mean, for us, the issue is that we have to have a financial plan going forward, telling, uh, finding out 
you know, 20 days to, before a, um, a new rates are struck or and also a new budgets are struck, isn't that hopeless, completely out of kilter with what any local government has to do? Um, yep, I, I have to acknowledge there are um, um, poor timing. Uh, there is poor timing alignment. Um, I'm just not sure that will be a significant impact for us in the 1920 annual plan because we do have some upside as well in terms of some of the uh, revenue we're expecting through the uh, Rotokauri public uh, transport facility. But so I think the implications already, might Chris, be more just on long that term. Bit, haven't you already explained to us that year one of the LTP hasn't been affected by NZTA's um, enhanced FAR um, problems. But Sorry, Dave, did you say year one of the long-term plan? Yeah. Which uh, is this year we're in now. Correct. But year two onwards has been. Haven't you given that as an answer to, to the Growth and Infrastructure Committee? Um, yep, yes, I, I have, because the work that we had programmed for this year is is funded by NZTA, so that's our, some of our large projects, the interchange, the work on Peacocks, um, Thomas Gordonton, um, the, uh, we are getting additional enhanced FAR, we expect, on the Rotokauri public transport facility than what we programmed in our 10-year plan. Um, so there should be an, an upside for that. The, we had also not planned to do, with, with a couple of exceptions, not to do a lot of physical works where the big money is this year. We had always planned so for this year. So when you're saying this year and that, please... Say year one or year two, yeah. because we're so about in to finish year one. year one, and the annual plan is for year two onwards. Um, yep. So for for year one, uh, which, is, which is the current year we're in, we hadn't. Eighteen nineteen. Which is eighteen nineteen. Uh, we hadn't planned, uh, apart from those big projects, to do a lot of physical works. Um, most of the physical works um, starts in year two, which is next year. Yeah, and that's exactly the point I'm asking mm. about. Mm. Uh, you're saying you don't think we're going to get affected today, but the other day in the hour, you're saying, yes, we could be affected. I, I think we will. I, we sorry, will to be, be clear, I think we will be affected. So what sort mm. of effect is that going to have on the, annual, the, the, the budget for next year, the annual plan? I mean, yep. we don't know. Is that the answer? The answer is that we, we don't know the funding situation, they haven't declared that to us yet, um, to the emerging risk which I'm identifying that uh, the funding may not be available to do some of those projects but I don't know at this point in time. So I what have we done about that risk, the risk of not knowing and not being able to calculate our annual plan um, accordingly and accurately? Yeah look I'll, I'll have to take that offline, I, I don't think that we have um, built the annual plan uh, on the basis of, uh, we've built the annual plan on the basis of getting the funding in year two that we had anticipated. Yeah, and that, so my worry is we're about to sign off on the annual plan and uh, we uh, don't know the effect because NZTA we provide significant revenue to us every year. Mm. Uh, we don't know how that's going to affect our projects, whether we go ahead or not, or we can substitute or not. Mm. We just don't have an idea. And I, is the, I don't think there's enough time, is there, no, between that, the 4th of June and the 26th it's not, of June. It's not. And the approach we've yeah, taken is that we don't thinking. know, and so we haven't included it. But within the Finance Committee cycle, the 1st of August being one of them, when we have more clarity, we'll, we, we need to deal with that issue. There may be no issue or there may be an issue. Um, well, but you're right, if we have a significant reduction in subsidy from NZTA, we will have to come together and talk about our capital programme and say what's out, because we'll, if, we, if we have a redu reduction in our revenue, we'll yeah, breach the I, 230. I understand that's how you're planning to do it. I, can, I mean, you can see that. But when you said we haven't included it, in actual fact, we haven't, we've included the best case scenario, most probably. Well, just, just what we had in the, the, yeah. the long-term plan at the time. Should we not be... Uh, making some educated guesses um, mm. to to reduce our exposure. I don't I don't think there's any value in doing that. And bear in mind that the annual plan is just a plan. And in terms of the authorisation around spending for capital programs, we'll have time to revisit that 
um, after it's baked into the um, annual plan through the finance committee in the six weekly cycle. So I think the points so you can make are valid. all that stuff we've been doing over the annual plan doesn't really matter. Is that what you're no, saying? No, it does matter, and that's our map from now. We have no information to tell us that we are not going to receive that, that revenue. Um, okay. But, so but there I are ask... emerging issues that are coming like Arthur Porter Drive that yeah. we also did not include, right? So, yeah. so there are a number of topics that But there are does. some things that are within our control and some things within NZTA and the gov therefore the government's control. That's right. And, and the, the NZT Arthur Porter Drive is one project. The NZTA subsidy goes across dozens of projects if you break them all down. That's right. And, and I'm, I was trying to find out what, not just what we're doing within our own budget, budgeting f in terms of uh, anticipating that risk, but what, are we not going to the government and saying your uh, I was going to use a naughty word, your mucking around through your agency and ZTA is causing problems for this local government agency, potentially, and by inference, every other local government agency as well. I mean, have they got that message that coming round July the 4th is just <coughs> stupid and a waste of everyone's time in terms of... Um, doing what we're supposed to be doing as a council, putting out a budget um, well, that's ac as accurate as we can possibly make it. Well, and there's no doubt through our conversations around the Infrastructure Financing Fund that central government have a huge appetite to support growth in the, in the local environment. So this, this seems at odds to that, and I, I take your point, but that was the confidence behind us um, not flag One, we, did, we don't know in, uh, that there's going to be any impact on the NZTA, and we don't, we, we've got no information to be able to make guesses. Um, or estimates. And second, hang, uh, hang on, David, I want to challenge you on that. We received a letter in March, this council, yep. from NZTA saying the enhanced FAR is, is spent, pretty much. We've had subsequent um, comments verbally that the Mayor's reported um, from the, the um, Housing and Transport Minister that uh, I think the words were that NZTA has um, sort of frightened of shadows sort of comment, you know, that it's not correct that they've got the short of money. Yeah. Um, surely we've been trying to hunt that down as to, so that we can, you Staff guys can trying give to us be down. better yeah. intelligence yeah. before setting the annual plan. Dave, um, great line of questioning. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I, I'm not sure where, so I think we acknowledge, I, I guess we acknowledge we, we, there's a lot of uncertainty don't we now have to, how are we going to deal with that uncertainty? Yeah, I guess I, what I was trying to find yeah. out, should we not be doing more in risk mitigation, yeah, like yeah, adjusting yeah. our budgets and writing stiff messages to the government? Yeah, well, well uh, acknowledging that we need, you know, we need to be strong with the NZTA yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just trying to find yeah. out no, where, where we're going to go. Point. If I could just pick up on this, Councillor, look, I, I expect there, um, there will be a reaction up and down the country on this issue, not just from Hamilton, because I think it will affect a lot of <coughs> councils' um, planning. I, I think some of the issues are about the amount of funding, which is not really NZTA's um, of the doing. Um, you know, it's the GPS and what funding's been put into the allocation. So I think uh, the, the government would be looking at that as well as NZTA. I do take your point and agree with your point on the decision-making process of NZTA is, probably hasn't helped, um, you know, to um, up until this point. But I, I expect uh, when we've got the clarity, and I expect that will be in the next couple of days, um, that we can start addressing that and how you want to respond to it. Um, we do have a scheduled report coming to GNI already, anticipating this, um, just about NZTA funding and the implications. And we do have, as I said, Ross Janssen coming to that meeting to be able to um, uh, um, help us. Um, get even more clarity. So what's that on the six, what date is the GNI? I think it's on the 18th or something is like that. Is it not possible that. to be ready to call, if, if we need to adjust our annual plan to be ready to call a um, special meeting or hook it on to some other meeting so that we staff have a chance to write something into the annual plan before the 26th if we need to do changes? Yep. Okay, that, that's uh, we, a good we, point. We, um, but I don't know if we want to be setting dates for meeting. No, quite no, yet, I don't but, want to, I, yeah. I'm asking staff to consider yeah, yeah. doing that. Yep, yeah, yep. I guess. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. And so just to be clear, so you have asked that um, 
we get another a meeting so that we can discuss this or, or a workshop or something so we get if, some clarity. If the information that we yeah. get uh, early, which well, in the next couple of days, uh, warrants a um, in, in management's opinion a, a change of um, annual plan figures, can we convene something ahead of yep. normal schedule? Can you so I'm wondering if that could be just sort of minuted as a, or, yeah, as a note. Yep. So just okay, checking thank you. with David, the answer was yes, as soon as we get the clarity, um, we'll, we'll run some scenarios. Uh, look, I'm not sure that the impact on the 1920 will be that significant, but I think it would be more significant about whether we proceed with two projects, another transport centre refurbishment and the school link, I think, are the two major projects that we'd anticipated um, uh, significant funding for, so we'll focus on those two projects. But yes, when, as soon as we know, we'll um, we'll look at the implications with um, David and come back. And some of those have uh, political implications too, like the tra the um, school link project has been promised by this council for two years. Um, the one last question, completely different, if I can, the Tiawa cycleway. Have you got a paragraph number, Dave, or in there? Oh, sorry, Chris gave it to us. I think it's in... It's uh, 66. 66, thanks. Oh, yeah. um, should we be looking at going ahead of, you know, like, finish our bit, even if the other councils aren't ready or their finances don't stack up? Uh, that's certainly our view as staff. Um, I think we need the clarity on funding for that one as well, And um, but that's certainly our view that we can proceed ahead of time and get it um, done, anticipating the next links. That's certainly the view we have. Some of the walkway goes on city streets, or some of the cycleway route goes on city streets, yep, that, Powell Avenue and so forth. Yep, that's exactly our thinking. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thank Angela? Um, just following on from Councillor McPherson's line of questioning, um, Chris, you were, I, when we first started reporting this way, um, I requested that we would have some oversight in those capital project reports on, um, that would link to the emerging issues or risks, how mi risks would w be mitigated at a high level, but this would be something that we could see on those spreadsheets, what projects, and you've just mentioned school links and, what was the other one? The transport centre, transport refurb centre. so that we would have high level oversight early on that those two things could be uh, up for some discussion. So that's still not on those sheets. Now I don't know how you'd express that, but just so that we continually have, elected members continually have a, a, a high level eyesight on risks and how, but more importantly how we could mitigate them in the future if and when it happened. Uh, look, I think that's a really Good point, and in hindsight, we could have put that link in this report uh, with the funding risk and maybe identified the projects that would affect in 1920. So yep. we'll certainly take that on board. Yep. Okay. Um, so just on um, point 63 on the last professional services panel, mm. um, I take that to read uh, that they are taking that the. The consultants on who have been appointed onto that panel are taking the opportunity to increase their costs because we are reformulating that panel or reappointing that panel. Um, I mean, surely there's something that we can manoeuvre there because we've just restructured LAS to deliver even better, uh, more efficiencies for the partners in LAS and uh, cost savings to us. So. I mean, you've indicated there that the, this uh, resetting of the market could result in significant price implications. Um, I can't remember how we appoint that panel, but surely we can push back on this. I mean, uh, they're entitled to make an extra dollar, but we're yeah. also entitled to go elsewhere in the market. Yeah, yeah look, I, I think um, councillors uh, should be assured that our respective teams will be looking for value of money and getting the right rates. I think the... Uh, we've ra just raised it as an emerging issue because the, the PSB has been so successful over uh, the previous period. We got uh, really uh, negotiated good rates and we've held the consultants to those rates for quite a long period of time. Um, so just it's coming into a new market and some of them have indicated that their, their rates are far too low and they'll be looking to put the rates up. But they are going into a, a process where um, uh, they will be 
the, the rates will come under scrutiny uh, for value for money. So there will be processes in place to make sure that the rates uh, are very competitive and uh, particularly to get onto the panel, um, there's some, you know, it's a privilege, I guess, to be on the panel and the rates yes, should reflect right. that. Mm. Yes, because uh, I mean it, it makes the processes for us faster having a panel because we don't have to widely tender every time. But yeah, so yeah I'm just and, and in general, the the rates that uh, we get through the panel are a lot less than you'd get um, just on going for one project on the market. So that yeah. sort of scrutiny goes into the whole process to make sure we are getting that discounted rate uh, because they're part of the panel. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm on page. Um, not sure. 45, so possibly 44 Can on diligence. Can you do paragraph as well, Angela? Oh, no, there's no paragraph. There is um, no paragraph. No. It's the spreadsheet of all the capital projects. Do you want to go further into the report? Does it matter where I go? Um, I'm just looking at just, so just the overall total capex and revenue is at 31 March. So again, following on from Councillor McPherson's concerns, down the bottom there, or second to the bottom, the transport improvement um, capital program and budget. So right along the right, the first column where it says revenue to date, actual 7.5 million. So that's that's all NZTA subsidies, isn't it? So what could, I mean, let's hope not, but what, what a high level worst case scenario risk that's a big envelope of money. And so are you saying, Chris, that, and David, I guess, that we can't respond to that unless we get some uh, pretty hard evidence that in time, and it doesn't sound like it is going to be in time, um, that we'll have to readjust our budget. But it's $7.5 million is a lot in one year. And I'm assuming, I mean, that's only the transport improvement program. There's going to be NZTA subsidies as you work up through that column and all of those other project areas, isn't there? Yeah, so, um... Let me so, we, so what, what this says is that we've received $7.5 million yeah. year to date. Yeah. We had budget of 5.5. We've actually received more than what we had budgeted year oh, to sorry, date. Oh, sorry, this is this year too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So the overall annual budget is 21.7, but we've deferred 7.6. Yeah. So yeah. we have got, we're expecting at this stage to receive 15.1. That's not the stuff that we're worried about yeah. at risk, sorry. okay? Um, yeah. yeah. That, the, yeah. Sorry, I, re I realised my mistake as I was talking. <laughs> um, okay, just a couple of other questions. Um, I'm on page. You can't really see the page that you're on in Diligent easily. I think I'm on page. Yeah, mine, mine's not. Um, I think I'm on page 48, but it's page 49 of the agenda. No, no paragraph. Okay. Renewals, and Renewals and compliance. Yeah. So just under um, on the left, under capex, well, uh, it's page. It'll be page 49 of hard copy and 48 of diligent. 250,000 for the cemeteries management system, um, which was operating but now requires capital funding. Can you just? Exp oh, sorry, I couldn't find any other commentary on that project in the report. Yeah, so that's just through the annual plan. <coughs> yeah. Um, that's going to be in next year's um, program, but it's just been a movement from the operating budget into the capital budget. So it's not new funding. It's just a way we treat it. So, same, so if I can help, same same amount of cash. But when yeah. we first embarked on that, we thought it might be a software as a service, which is classed as opex, but okay. it's actually. Um, it's not that way, so therefore it's capex. Okay, all right. And just one last question. Don't ask me where this one is. Um, just checking on um, Rota Cowrie. Uh, no, sorry, Baverstock Road upgrade. There's a slight delay or deferral. Sorry, I want, it's impossible to find the page right on that one. I didn't make a note. Um, but I think I also read in the report that you were, it was rephasing deferral of part of that Baverstock urban upgrade project because there's other work happening in the area and you wanted to take advantage of that? Can you remember? Sorry, I just can't no, find my page so it's quickly. Just, it's actually just aligning with the contractor's program. It's, um, it is yeah. a rephasing deferral, so it's not a delay. Yeah. It's just um, we've had to push out money to make sure we align with the contractor's program and how they're going to deliver it.
Okay, all right. So no other delays indicated in that for that project. All right. Um, thank you. Thanks, Angela. Paula. Thank you. Just wanted to do touch base with the make a couple of comments in the report about the Tiawa Cycleway remediation, um, and that it's the NZTR. Is this cat caught up in the same thing? But why are they saying they have to wait for Waipa and Waipa and Waikato? Um, so we got we got two projects. So uh, one is fixing the slip um, at, at Kiri Kiri but in the river path. So that's got a Tiawa label um, to it. And then we got another project which is extending our walkway from Peacocks right through to the velodrome. Mm. So that's called Tiawa. So the one that's got the Waikato and Waipa dependency is the new bit of Tiawa from the, um, the Cobham Drive Bridge through Hammond Park um, to our boundary, and then it's a, a section from Waikato that gets up through Tamahiri, and then there's a Waipa section that goes all the way to the velodrome. <coughs> so the remediation project is a, a separate project to fix the slip in the river path. That's the bit by London Street? Yeah. 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 And so is that at risk, or...? Uh, that'll be at the funding risk, but there's no dependency on Waikato or Waipa in that one. Okay. Yeah. If it's at funding risk, does that mean, because it was going to be done next year and people have waited a very long time, does that mean it potentially won't be done next year? It, won't... Um, it, it will mean that it will probably have to come back to Council if there's no NZTA funding. Uh, do Council want to fund it on their own without NZTA funding? Well, that's very disappointing. Um, just one other question. In terms of these spreadsheets, I'm not on diligent today, unfortunately, but because um, I'm still learning how to manoeuvre in, inside it. Um, they, the, the page I don't know, 58, where they have got these um, lists of deferrals, and um, you've got the columns, and down the fourth column it says either things like third party dependency and other. I, don't, I just wondered if there's a better way we can do with that, to deal with that descriptor, because um, every time I see third party dependency, um, I, I don't know who the third party is. It could be NZTA, but for a different project, it could be someone else. And the other tells you nothing for the reason of deferral, um, except yep. there's a little bit in the notes, but um, yep. um, sometimes the it's not entirely clear why it's not. So the intent is to capture that in the notes and maybe we can do a better job on that. Mm. Uh, invariably, the third party dependency is something we've dealt with um, in council from year to year. It's, it's our alignment with the development community. So we're normally we're partnering with developers to share the cost of infrastructure. So and their, quite their often readiness? the timing is and the pace of development is set by the developers. So invariably, when we're deferring, when you see third party dependency is the developer's timing is not matching uh, where we've put the funding. Uh, but I take your point, and I think uh, um, the explanation is probably the right place to uh, give more clarity on the issues, uh, and we've tried to do that. But um, It's we'll still a bit engineer-speak in there, isn't it, in terms of yeah. um, governors um, understanding what yeah. they could say to the public yeah. about why the work hasn't progressed. Yeah. It's not yeah. very easy to do that from yeah. that. Yep, and the the, um, the third party dependency is a field in our P Soda system, so it needs to be just a short descriptor to so we can um, filter the projects. Um, but the explanation should be the plain English sort of explanation. So we'll we'll try and do uh, that a little bit more clearly. Yeah, I just think there are some things of high public interest as there's maintenance and renewals that sort of rats and mice maintenance renewals and then there are other things like playgrounds and libraries and <coughs> river slips and things that have um, a lot of public interest around them. We should be able to go out and say, well, it isn't going ahead right now because, and it should be fairly straightforward for us to do so. But, yeah, thank you for that. That helps. Thank you. Mark. Thank you. Um, there was talk recently uh, of our footpaths improvements being deferred or held back. Is that tied up with the NZTA shakiness as well, or where were we at with that? That's a, that's a different issue, um, completely separate to this. Is release a note um, about the footpath? Oh, um, Jason, sorry, the footpath deferrals delays. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> um, there was discussion. Join the rest of us, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's wonderful. Yeah. Right, now that I have everyone in the palm of my hand. Um, no, there was talk uh, at a recent meeting about um, footpath improvements that we've, you know, we've boldly said are accelerating. Yeah. Um, not accelerating quite so fast. Where are we at with those? And is that tied up with the NZTA um, shakiness? No, no, we're looking um, to accept, continue to accelerate that program to be able to deliver what we've set out for this financial year. Okay, so the next financial year? Um, again, it'll be set, we are working through the TCE, so that's a target cost estimate for next year, yep. and looking to allocate the funding that's currently available to deliver that program of works as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. So can you just, uh, can I just drill down to the, um, the school run a little bit, Chris? Um, there's money allocated for that, but again, it's not locked in stone, is it, for the, the school uh, run? No, look, um, fun funding is uh, never locked in stone, and this has been the case for year after year after year until you get to the point in time that you're, you're ready to, to build the project. Um, so the... There's two issues with the school link. I think one is the, the business case and the, uh, the approval process. So mm. that is uh, going and going quite well now, but that's been quite um, slow in getting a uh, head of steam up. Yeah. Uh, but it will come to the point where the, I think the funding will be uh, an issue very shortly. Yeah, OK. Mm. All right. So uh, well, I don't know we're at the consultation phase with that, but how much more can we do with, with that spectre hanging over our heads? Yeah, could could I leave that uh, question to be answered in the next couple of days? Like I, yep. I got a, a phone call this morning, which indicated I should have some clarity on the funding tomorrow. Okay, and I think um, that would then allow us to sit down and just dive into that level of detail. Okay, cool, thank you. And um, asbestos on the ring road, where, where, where would you put asbestos? Yep. So it? I think there's um, there's an old landfill site in that oh. area. So we we obviously did a lot of. Uh, testing before we, we've done it, but mm. um, you're just putting oh, holes in little paces and, uh, and there's a risk that you're, you, you miss sort of characterising everything under the ground. Yeah. So yeah. it'll be asbestos in an old landfill, um, Roughly uh, is my yeah. understanding. Sorry, Chris Barton's not here, but I think um, th that's the reason. Do you know whereabouts on the ring road or what part of the ring road? Um, it, it's, it'll, it'll be on the, the garden side of Common Drive. Oh, right, yeah. Oh, by the way, the flyer yeah. is going to... OK. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Rob. Yeah, thanks, to you. Um, thanks for your report, Chris, um, and Natalie. Uh, just as an add-on to Councillor O'Leary, is it possible that we could have, around the NZTA um, uh, applications and, and their share of funding, is it possible that we can have a list of projects that show what's been approved, um, what's um, tentative... Uh, and what's potentially at risk and, and have that kind of like a moving balance so that we know uh, on a regular basis what's moved from tentative or at risk to being a, 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 a more of a possibility or, or we know and, and we can then make adjustments to our, our plan, you know, our own budgets so accordingly. So we've got, we've got that list and we'd be happy yeah. to share that with you. Okay. But it show, it sh it'll show where we're at in the process, so whether we've had a point of entry discussion, whether yep. we're into a strategic yeah, case and that great. sort of thing, because often that can cause delays as well. So Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And what about the bigger picture, say, Southern Links, you know, which I think was on the... Yeah, and that, that's uh, projects which are within and outside the city. Um, can we also include those on that list? Because, uh, you know, uh, residents do ask us, you know, what's happening, and Southern Links is a good example. You know, where is that now? Is it still on the five-year, or has it gone back to 20 years, or and so forth? Yep, so... Um the, the answer is yes, probably more appropriately at the Growth and Infrastructure Committee. But, um, if you take... Uh, Southern Links, it's not our project, um, so it's not part of this, it's, it's NZTA's project, uh, but really important to the development of our network. So the answer is yes, we can, um, through the NZTA report, um, give some visibility of the yep. NZTA projects as well. But it does enter the city, doesn't it, at various I, points? I, look, absolutely. Um, our customers don't understand that it's an NZTA project, they just see it as a, a Greater Hamilton project. Um, so look, on that one there, um, councillors recall that 
Um, we've been advocating for many years to do that one. It's all planned, ready to go. Um, been advocating for the funding, um, but it's, it's not anywhere in the next 10 years. We don't, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, they're funding uh, property purchase at the moment to get it ready. Um, I expect this council will continue in its advocacy to bring that one forward. Yep, okay. And my other questions are around page, um, oh goodness me, uh, page 57 on diligent. Sorry, well, Rob, could you put a, give us a paragraph number? Well, no, it's, a, it's attachment three. Oh, okay. Uh, I, uh, um, and it's it listed up total capital and revenue movements. Uh, so there are two, on that particular page, there are two, um, two tables. And I'm... Oh, they see. Okay, and I'm just trying to get my head around the differences between the two. Um, I assume on the capital movement summary, the 83 million of deferred movements is 83 million in our capital budget that we are not spending this year, but carrying over to the next year. So that's correct? Yes. Yep. So the 83 is the sum of the 28 and the 55 yeah, that's right. in the next yeah. two years. So they've been pushed into the other yeah. two years. And that's, of course, in red on that one. But the one below the deferred movements for revenue are in black. But I assume that's the same again. That's 16 million that we propose to spend on revenue, uh, revenue uh, movements, re re renewal of assets, and so forth. Yeah, and it's and directly rate, related to the capital movement above. But you're right. I've, I've, no, I, that should it, because we talk about revenue as negative as a, as a credit. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry. But it means yeah, the same. Absolutely. The, okay. So yeah. so. So, okay, so that now my question is, are we certain that those deferred movements, you've got 83 million in capital and 16.8 million in revenue, that they will be spent in the 19, 20 and the 2021 year? So some of them have actually been pushed out to year three already because oh, we've okay. actually done a full review of the portfolio across the three years and understood that even next year we won't be able to deliver some of that okay. stuff because they're not ready. So what's gone into the, in terms of value, are we looking at 50 million in that third year or are we looking at, at 323 million next okay. financial year? Yep. 300, just, just, just remembering. Okay, okay, so from 321. Well, to it, we went up yesterday. That 323 is the figure from okay. Tuesday, basically, with the new stuff that was added. So how much is roughly then going to go into the 21, 22 year, which I guess is the next 10 year plan, isn't it? Nothing at the moment. Nothing, nothing at the moment. Oh, nothing. Not, so it's still, it's still going to be within those two years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so remembering, Council, of the 83 million that we're signalling, yep. 50 million of that is, is contracted and underway. So. Um, okay. We, so that's we, so so roughly it's underway, but it's not going to be spent. It, until it won't those be spent two, in that two year, financial but years. But we're really confident it'll be spent in the three years because it's contracted yep. okay. and underway. Okay, thank yep, you. Yep. And then the question that follows on from that uh, and maybe is best directed to David, is the financial impact of these deferrals, both <coughs> revenue and capital, is that included in those budgeted deficits that were reported um, in terms of balancing our books yes. um, on, Tuesday, yes. on Tuesday's meeting? So it's in yes. the four, seven and three million dollar deficits that yes. we're projecting for those, for those years. Okay, thank you. Sigi. Thank you. Chair, and, and just following on from, thank you for your report, and uh, following on from Councillor Pascoe, just a question, I mean, there's a huge amount of deferrals and they're going now over a few more years. Um, w will it have any impact on the costs? Because other, you know, costs are going up. I know you, a lot of it has to do with contractor timing as well, but um, are, is, have we got enough contingency in there to mitigate if costs rise dramatically? The, of, of the 83, 50 are contracted, so the answer to that is no, because we're contracted uh, to deliver and we've got a cost to deliver. Yeah. Um, uh, for the balance that we're deferring out, uh, the answer to your question would probably be yes, there would be a risk. Um, so the market's moving all the time, yeah. so we only lock down the cost when we know exactly what we're building and when we go to the market. So all of those risks e exist, but we do 
uh, manage those risks through contingency amounts that we allow for it and escalation provisions. Okay. So the answer is yes, but we do make provisions to, to manage that. Okay, thank you. James. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris and Natalie, for the um, extensive report. Are you sleeping well at night, Chris? Because um, we've... we've um, you look terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we've uh, spent a bit of time on key risks here, and uh, you know, there's a lot happening around the city, coming into and out of the city. But, um, uh, and a lot of our projects are relying on that, that uh, real um, critical NZTA funding. Um, how concerned are you in regards to that funding coming through? Because if we don't get it, that's going to cause some big concerns, isn't it? Yep, so, so as we, I, I talked in the beginning, our, our large sort of growth projects were in uh, really good shape. We have got um, uh, good um, funding and, and lockdown funding with NZTA for a lot of our large capital. I am concerned uh, about our ability to deliver our transport improvement projects. Um, I think they are projects that in some regard are more meaningful to our existing community in terms of um, safety and uh, pedestrian amenity and public transport. Um, yep, we're, we're doing a lot of really good work, work um, through the uh, Maxis Hamilton Task Force and the Low Cost, Low Risk Program. So we did get a substantial increase in funding this year in that program, uh, like every other council in New Zealand. That, that's part of the reason why the funding is oversubscribed, because they allocated a, a lot more into that low cost, low risk. So just to remind you, those are small projects under a million dollars that you get a bulk funding for that. So the bulk funding that we've got uh, for the next three years for that is quite substantially higher than we've ever had before. So there's a lot of really good work um, uh, around the city being done under that category, which is secure. But there are a lot of really important ones in the transport improvement program. So yes, I am worried about the funding situation and not being able to do some of those. Has the, uh, the, the transport blowout in Auckland uh, affected the NZTA funding? Um, I'm not sure if they're giving money to the, uh, the rail system up there where they're a billion dollars under funded. That, that'll be, certainly be putting pressure on the overall system, but the way funding works is that, that um, government allocate funding into different categories, not NZTA. So the government, through the GPS for the three-year period, they say how much money should be spent on state highways, how much should be spent on local roads, um, how much should be spent on transitional rail. So the issue, we've got most of our funding is coming out of the local government um, vote, if you like, um, and that's the one that's under pressure for the projects that are at risk for us. So it's separate from NZTA funding. So if you go to some of those big projects, I think they're NZTA um, state highway projects. Um, and I'm not sure of the funding arrangement for CRL, Central Rail Link, which is the, the cost increase that you're talking about. But I, I think the pressure is coming within the funding that government had allocated for local government to do their improvements. Thank you. Paula. So my, mine's just a follow-up question from that, because I was just thinking about the potential deferrals in the transport. Are they, are they given us any clue whether these are like... Uh, are they going to prioritise carrying on with safety or connectivity? Or is it coming out of cycling and walking again, as it has done in the past? Where, where are they, what steer, excuse me, what steer are we getting from them in terms of what the priorities will be if they haven't got the money? <coughs> we, we don't um, have that uh, steer yet. I, I think from what I'm hearing, safety is going to be the key priority. Um, but I, that's the clarity I hope to get the next day down to the granular level of our projects and um, what I expect to get is a list of the projects and they categorise them and um, funded likely or unlikely. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we should have that information tomorrow but I, I do think there is um, a focus on putting a priority into the safety category projects but I, I just don't know the clarity until the next mm. few days. That's what I was wondering, because I know in the past they have done exactly that, pair back on other things and just a look at the um, key connective routes, connect, connectivity for economics and safety. So economic and safety was always up 
up there and then safety um, and then um, local projects cycling walking and we're sort of in an also ran basket so I was just wondering whether those are going to take the biggest hit but we won't know till tomorrow you say uh, or the next few days um, but, but I think once again there's different funding categories for local road improvements and a different one mm. for public transport um, so I think they're all over prescribed is my understanding so that's the clarity we'll get tomorrow. So if the public transport is over-subscribed, how are they going to prioritise that nationally? Um, I understand that's the work that NZTA have been doing around nationally. Um, how do they prioritise within each of those funding categories? I'm just mm. not sure that they're looking at um, taking funding out of categories and putting them to the other ones. Mm. But within the local road uh, vote... Um, I think, Chris, we know that you don't know. So mm. you can stop. Mm. Mm. Well, are well, you just saying I don't know in a whole whole lot of different ways? <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. Um, on paragraph seven, there's uh, it says there's three uh, eight hundred eighty three million point four signalled uh, deferrals of which 53.5 relate to projects that are underway, uh, and 8.7 relate to projects where the timelines are set by third party uh, developers. That still leaves 21 million unexplained. Explain, please. Uh, yep, if, uh, if you went to the attachment that Councillor Southgate was talking to, um, so all would, of those uh, figures, uh, are they, are they? you can okay. see those figures in that table. Um, so okay, that, 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 that would be the other. Cool, <laughs> you can show me after. Okay, yep. thank you. Um, just you talk about, uh, okay, I guess we've already discussed the NZCA uncertainty. Uh, okay, that's cool. All right, um, if there are no further questions, I will move the recommendation. Which is simply that the finance committee receives the report. Do I have a seconder? Uh, sorry, um, who wants? Okay, James. Sorry, Siggy. Sorry, Mark. You can do the next one. <laughs> um, is there any debate? Okay, thank you. We'll put it. Those in favour. Those against. Carried unanimously. Thank you. Righto, members. Um, I suggest we have a break now until half past eleven. If you could be back by then, please.